So last month, the horrific massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School sparked anger and debate, and it continues, of course, to be a, a big topic of conversation. Just this morning, we saw yet another incident, another school shooting. Um, this coming Saturday, an estimated 500,000 people will attend the March for Our Lives gun control march in Washington, D.C. And alongside these efforts, well-financed national groups are working to help turn this outrage into a sustained effort to rein in access to the nation's deadliest guns. Here to discuss the public health crisis arising from the American dysfunction of gun violence, I'm very, very honored to, to welcome our panelists, Nzari Kepra with Drs. Dean Winslow and Garen Wintemute. Okay, so thank you guys so much for being here. Um, we're gonna start off by just getting a little bit of context. Um, not that we all need a reminder of the numbers, but we're gonna start with that regardless. So I wanna pull up a slide, and you'll see it on the monitors in a second here, hopefully. Um, so this is showing gun viol incidents of gun violence just in 2018 through mid-March. So the, there actually have been there, even more now, um, but this is about 11,000 incidents of gun violence throughout the country, close to 3,000 deaths, again, just in 2018 alone. So um, with that as context, Garen, I want to start with you. Um, you have written about, spoken about, done so much work in framing this conversation as a, as a public health crisis. Can you give us a bit of just insight into what that means to frame it this way and what impact that has on how we treat it. Sure. I'm going to steal uh, words from Dr. Bill Satcher, who was director of CDC 20 years ago, when he said, look, if, if violence isn't a health problem, then why are all these people dying from it? Mm -hmm. it it's really quite simple. Um, I make this comparison among others that in the last 10 years or any 10-year period you care to mention, we have lost more civilians to firearm violence in the United States than we had combat fatalities in World War II. That's a health problem. Absolutely. Okay, we're gonna each, each one of our speakers, by the way, comes at this from a very different perspective and has a very different um, story to, to, to share with you all and takeaways to share with you. So Nzari, Yours is a very personal one. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this movement several years ago, actually. And we're going to pull up another photo. And again, this one is a, a much more personal story. Can you tell us who we're looking at first? Yes, yeah, so this is Heidi Pendleton. Um, she was 15 years old in 2013 when her and about 10 other friends were sheltering themselves from the rain in a park that was about five minutes away from our high school. And two gunmen came and opened fire. And she was shot in the back and later pronounced dead at, in the emergency room. Um, Hadia was a key light in our school community. She was on the volleyball team. She was a majorette in actual, actually in um, President Obama's second inauguration. Um, and it happened just a few days after, right? It happened just a few days after the inauguration. Um, and truly, I think it really ravaged our community. As a, a Chicagoan um, and a young person, I was very aware of the gun violence that was going on around me, but I didn't really understand how it would affect um, us. And to see someone like Hadia, who was an honor roll student, had one of the brightest smiles, and made sure that she was constantly giving to the people around her, um, become a victim of a gun violence epidemic in Chicago, it forced us to decide to make a change. Um, and so me and a couple of other friends from King, which was the high school that we both attended, um, and a couple of other high schools around Chicago, got together and had a discussion where we were very fortunate enough to have Adia's mother, Cleo Pendleton, as well as Lupe Fiasco, basically mod moderate a whole entire discussion about what violence was to us and our personal experiences with it. And that became the, the initial start for the work that an organization we all created called Project Orange Tree began. Um, 
and that was just a youth-led violence awareness organization in Chicago. And from that point forward, it just stemmed and rolled into now we're working with the We're Orange campaign, which is a national movement that we do every June 2nd. Thank you. Um, okay, Dean, I'm going to turn to you to, to share a bit um, about your connection. And you, um, I think you said in one interview that you sort of accidentally became a, a spokesperson on, on gun violence. But um, last year, you were up for the role of Assistant Secretary um, for Health Affairs in President Trump's administration. Um, during your confirmation hearing with uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee, you said the following. I may get in trouble with other members of the committee, but let me just say how insane it is that in the United States of America, a civilian can go out and buy a semi-automatic assault rifle like an AR-15, which apparently was the weapon used. This is right after the Texas church shooting. Um, tell us about what happened next. And I want to know also where you, I mean, it's Im Im implicit here or explicit in, in your quote that you realize there might be some backlash to this. Mm -hmm. Yes, Michal. Well, first of all, you know, thanks for having me here. And I also just want to say, you know, to thanks to Garen for really the wonderful work he's done over the last couple decades on this issue, and, and Zari, who gives me hope that really something good may come out of this, because this is really where the energy is going to come from, is from young people. But anyway, so um, uh, uh, you know a little bit about my background, that uh, I'm a professor of medicine at Stanford, and uh, I'd also uh, served for 35 years as a flight surgeon in the United States Air Force. Oh, we're getting you a microphone. Uh, in Technical the difficulties, apologies. Yeah, so in addition to you know being an internist, and uh, I'd also served for 35 years as a flight surgeon in the United States Air Force and the Air National Guard and uh, deployed four times to Iraq and uh, twice to Afghanistan after uh, the 9-11 attacks. So I certainly saw firsthand you know, the damage that these uh, weapons of war do to, uh, to human beings. Uh, you know, just a little bit also background, you know, I'd become friends with uh, uh, General Jim Mattis uh, when we were both at Stanford. And uh, I have the greatest respect for him. You know, again, he's the finest combat leader, really, of our generation. And uh, when he asked me to consider serving as his Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, obviously, I jumped at the chance. Uh, I was a little surprised at the hearing, you know, because uh, one of the issues that was brought up uh, by uh, the Democratic senator from New Hampshire, was, which was really had nothing to do with my responsibility, but was, uh, you know, questioning about why the shooter in that uh, uh, Texas massacre, you know, had received a certain category of discharge and why his uh, name wasn't reported to the database and, of course, uh, you know, caught me a little flat-footed and I admitted that it sounds like the Air Force dropped the ball and I uh, said certainly if I'm confirmed for this position, I'll rec recommend to the secretary that uh, an IG inspection be done to look for why this happened. And uh, again, I think if I'd uh, been quiet after that and just left it at that, I'd be the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. But and who uh, knows whether that would have been a good or a bad thing. Exactly. <laughs> but I just, just couldn't resist it. You know, I uh, you know, said that, you know, as a You might have been fired by now, by the way. <laughs> That's <so>. true. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, I kind of made the mistake of trying to educate people and say, well, as a flight surgeon who's, who's uh, you know, investigated uh, aircraft mishaps, usually there's a whole chain of events that go into a, a terrible tragedy like what happened. And then uh, I said that, uh, you know, when you look at a whole chain of events, you have to look at an obvious thing, which is uh, why, you know, we allow unrestricted access to, you know, these uh, uh, really terrible weapons uh, without any regulation. And, and I ended up, you know, withdrawing my nomination a little, little bit before Christmas. Um, but. Uh, Anyway, so that's kind of the genesis of it. But you know, again, I'd just like to say that uh, as a, f a father and uh, someone you know who cares deeply about uh, all human beings, I you know agree with Garen that I think it's just uh, uh, terrible that I think something like 38,000 people lose their lives to gun violence, which is uh, more than uh, uh, you know we lose to motor vehicle accidents and other things combined. And as you pointed out, to put it into perspective, that uh, I think if you total up all of the gun deaths over the last 30 years, it's kind of equivalent to the total number of combat deaths that we've had going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Um, so. Yeah, striking. Um, okay, well, some. I mean, it's it's a it's a complex problem, obviously, but some of, of your recommendations, all of you really, um, for what can be done are actually surprisingly simple. So 
Can you, each of you, just go into that a little bit? Garen, maybe we'll start with you. So, what is the physician's role primarily and, and more broadly? Sure. Um, a physician's role, as Dean just said, is to educate. One of the things that we point out to our fellow clinicians is that it's not enough just to take care of patients, <clears throat> that most people who die from gunshot wounds die where they're shot, as your friend did, or most likely. Um, and for us as clinicians, to make the greatest inroads into death from gun violence, we have to get, keep people from being shot in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna take one very specific, narrow example. There are lots. It's something that we have here in California that's called a gun violence restraining order. It's a relatively new policy. Our group is evaluating it. In, in very brief, when there's a high risk situation, when risk of harm to self or others is high and imminent and guns are part of the equation, Family members or law enforcement can go to a judge, as they do in cases of domestic violence, and basically say, Your Honor, we need help here. And the judge, following special, specialized rules of evidence, can issue an order that gets the firearms out of the situation. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact, because we're evaluating this program here, that in California, the gun violence restraining order has been used to prevent mass shootings, has been used to prevent terrorist events. I'm not speculating. Had the, a gun violence restraining order been available in Florida, it would have prevented the Parkland shooting. Mm -hmm. And Florida since has adopted a gun violence restraining order statute. Mm -hmm. oh. All right, by the way, in, in, in all states, are doctors able to talk to their patients? Yes. Because um, you mentioned Florida, and yes. I know that that was an issue there. Part of, part of the education we do is, is what I like to call myth busting. There never has been a gag order on physicians talking to patients, even in Florida. In Florida, the law said you shouldn't ask these questions, you shouldn't record the answers, but if it's relevant to the care of the patient, go right ahead. So people were always free to ask the questions and do something with the answers when it mattered. Okay. And now that law has been overturned by the U.S. Um, Court of Appeals, and it's moot. Got it. Dean? And so, Neil, I, I'm actually kind of approaching this uh, from the perspective of, a, of a, a pilot. I've actually been flying aircraft since I was 14 years old. And, uh, you know, first of all, just backing up, uh, you know, I think that, uh, uh, unfortunately, the National Rifle Association has sort of created this narrative over the last few decades that... Uh, the Second Amendment is an unrestricted right, and uh, I really don't believe that that's, uh, you know, historically correct. Uh, when if you look at something that's as high risk as owning a gun, uh, I, I feel that people should uh, meet certain minimum qualifications to be able to operate it. So, you know, going back, uh, I think every uh, firearm uh, should be registered and re-registered every few years, just like you do an airplane or an automobile. And I think in order to uh, be allowed to own a gun or operate a gun, it, uh, you should actually be required to undergo initial training and periodic recurrent training and also uh, reasonable things to make sure that these weapons are, are appropriately secured. As you know, in addition to you know, these terrible mass shootings, which of course get a lot of press, that there's uh, uh, you know, something like 60 suicides a day due to uh, firearms and, of course, uh, numerous uh, uh, homicides as well as accidental shootings. I think something like 4,000 children were killed accidentally uh, last year uh, in, uh, in the United States. Um, so in addition to that, uh, I also feel that uh, reasonable restriction, uh, which again I don't think violates the Second Amendment, would be to require that people have insurance, uh, liability insurance on their weapons. So for something, let's say, like a shotgun which is used for hunting, that would be a fairly low premium, but uh, a, a weapon like a semi-automatic 9mm uh, pistol or certainly something like an assault weapon, uh, that, uh, that, that there, there should be you know, much higher uh, premiums related to that because of the higher risk. I also personally feel, though, that uh, weapons of war, like assault rifles, uh, 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 really should be largely restricted to being kept at licensed ranges. Uh, and again, they should be locked up. Just to give, put this in perspective, as someone who's uh, qualified as expert, both with the 9mm pistol and the M16 rifle in the, in the military, um, we don't let people take their purse, these weapons home with them. Uh, they're locked up in an armory when you're done qualifying or using them on duty. Uh, so I think the fact that we do allow civilians where there's really no rational need for uh, particularly assault rifles, that, uh, that, that this is something that we really should, should look at. 
It's interesting, by the way, you know, you, you call these kind of common sense restrictions, and um, I've, I've read and, and heard several politicians and pundits bring up Israel as an example of like, well, look, there's a lot of guns and, uh, you know, and I, I grew up in Israel and I did grow up seeing a lot of guns around because there are so many soldiers around because the entire, you know, everybody goes through the military service, but there are many, many, many restrictions on who can purchase a gun, what kind of gun, and, and all of the above. And there aren't, there are many other issues on, in the region, obviously, but that is, this is not one of them. So, um, and Zari, what's, what's your take on the steps that should be taken? And I realize there are massive hurdles along the way, but what do you think are some of the common sense changes that should happen? For sure. First, I just want to say I agree with both of your perspectives, and I wanted to see how I could come in with a different perspective on this all, especially coming from um, the viewpoint as a young, do a young adult who is you know, just a common citizen, and I never, like, you know, had any official background when I was dealing with gun violence prevention. I will first off just say, you know, we all can get involved. I think a lot of people feel as if there is, like, a stigma about, oh, maybe I do not know enough, or maybe, you know, I um, won't benefit this cause by getting involved. But literally every single person can get involved. Like, with the Wear Orange campaign, for example, on June 2nd, Supporting is literally just tweeting or taking a picture of you wearing orange or just wearing orange and telling people the reason why you're wearing orange. That's just a small first step, but also at the same time, it's basically a coalition of people who are involved in gun violence prevention efforts in a variety of different ways. It could be coming from the perspective that Project Orange Street comes from. We look a little bit more about look a little bit more into structural violence, which is something that we could talk about a little bit later, but there's also domestic violence. If you find like some area that you are very passionate about that intersects with gun violence, find a way to get involved with it that way. It's gonna be a lot more beneficial if you're finding something you're passionate about and you're working hard in a way to not only prevent that cause but also look at gun violence within America. Um, and I would say as economist now, because I am currently a senior and I'm studying economics, um, you have to look at things. <laughs> I think so at this point. <laughs> you have to look at structural violence, which is looking at communities and seeing if they have failing school systems, institutionalized racism. Look at mental health issues. Look at all of these ways that there are causes to gun violence, like causes to people feeling like they need to pick up a gun in the first place. Because maybe we can't always stop it after the shot was wrong, but maybe we can stop it before someone even thinks about picking up the gun in the first place. Um, so I think there's a plethora of ways you can get involved in. Um, maybe it's reflecting on the communities that have the most violence, or maybe it's getting involved with the communities that you're passionate about the most. And I think we can't really talk about this topic with, without bringing up the importance and impact of race in this. Um, and you know, one of the, um, and we all have been reading about this, of course, but one of the suggestions that has been brought up um, in light of the recent big school shooting was arming teachers. And, and the topic of race, the impact that race would have here has come up repeatedly. And I, I just want to read real quick. Um, this is just one of several problems with that you know, suggestion, but multiple studies, including one from Yale University Child Study Center, have shown that implicit bias against black students shapes how teachers respond to them. That's not to imply explicitly that white teachers will be using guns against black students, but it does factor into how students of color are disciplined. Um, and this is a quote from a psychology professor from this center, implicit biases do not begin with black men and police, they begin with black preschoolers and their teachers, if not earlier. Implicit bias is like the wind. You can't see it, but you can sure see its effects. And it's, this is such a huge topic to unpack, clearly. But I just want to get your take. I mean, is this even, is this suggestion, just the notion of this? Like, is this just something that's been thrown out? Should we take it seriously? And if so, what are the implications? Arming teachers comes up almost after almost every big school shooting. Um, and people who know this issue far better than I do, at least, have crunched the numbers, have looked very carefully, comes down to this. The ratio for, for shootings of children of school age, the ratio between shootings that occur not at school and shootings that occur at school is 100 to 1. 
school shootings account for about 1% mm -hmm. of shootings of children of school age. School is actually the safest place for kids to be. Um, and the, to me, the voice that speaks loudest against arming teachers is the voice of the teachers who, by very large majority, say, not a chance. We're teachers. We're not cops. Yeah. One, one thing, I, you know, again, I agree with you completely, Again, There's also another strong argument against this. You know, again, one of the NRA's talking points is that we need more, quote, good guys with the guns to protect us. And it's really uh, just, just the data don't support that at all. Um, another thing is just from a law enforcement perspective is that uh, it's even well-trained uh, law enforcement officers have a lot of difficulty responding to active shooter situations. And you're just going to really, from a practical standpoint, compound the problem of law enforcement when that does occur. The more people you have not wearing uniforms and waving, uh, waving uh, weapons around. So it's again, it's very impractical and a bad idea from a number of standpoints. Yes, I totally agree. I don't understand why anyone ever gets to this point logically. I can't understand anyone's logic on that one, especially since we're looking at all of these different scenarios in which we see you know, the data showing that once a gun is introduced to a scenario, regardless of if there's any ill intention involved at all, it increases the chances of harm. It increases the chances of death. So. I can't understand how someone can just sit back and say, if we add more, it'll solve the issue. It won't. It'll just confuse the situation a lot further and maybe cause more accidental deaths. Mm -hmm. Any analogies, by the way, for if we really look at this as a disease, like in what case do you add more harmful, <laughs> add, just take more poison and I'm I know not, I'm simplifying I'm, it. I'm not aware of an analogy that applies. Yeah. Um, Firearm violence. I mean, we shouldn't bring up antibodies because that's different. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we won't talk about backfires. But, but firearm violence and the response to it are unique in the United States in many ways. Yeah. You're asking us questions that implicitly ask us to provide hard science-based answers. And so far, we're doing pretty good. But by and large, that's really difficult to do because for more than 20 years, there has been a sustained, concerted, successful effort to prevent research from being done on this problem. Mm -hmm. It's as if we said, you know what? Let's not do research on how to understand and prevent motor vehicle injuries. Let's mm -hmm. not do research on how to understand and prevent opioid overdoses. We know that that's really silly, and we don't take that approach with those problems, nor with heart disease and cancer. But that is the approach we've taken with firearm yeah. violence. So no wonder the problem is still with us. And, and on that point, there are no national studies on who owns guns, how gun owners acquired their weapons, theft of guns, number of households with guns, attributes of high quality gun training or the risk factors associated with gun violence. You've actually put some of your own money into research yes. to try and mitigate some of the lack of funding. Yes. Um, for a while, I was our program's major funder. <laughs> um, there, there have been, here's what we have, folks, nationwide. Um, we have surveys of maybe 1,500, 2,000 people nationwide, and we extrapolate answers for what's going on in the country based on those, um, those small number of responses. The, the center that, that I run, California, I'm gonna brag for just a moment. California is the home to the nation's first publicly funded center for research on firearm violence. It's, it's at UC Davis. One of our initial projects is a survey uh, that's just going to establish um, who owns firearms and all the things that you just mentioned. The last time that was done here in California was 40 years ago. We're doing a study just of the, in journalistic terms, the who, what, when, and where of fatal firearm violence, the descriptive epidemiology, we call it. The last time that basic, basic information was gathered in California was 30 years ago. And I know that because I'm the person who did it when, when I was just getting started. And now I have a new generation of people who are doing it and I get to watch and have fun. We want to go to a, 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 just a couple of questions. We are starting to run out of time, but there are some back there. We will try to get to as many of you as you can. So let's try and be brief. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Roger E. Kirch. Uh, I'm a professor of early American history at Virginia Tech. And I'd like to say this is a particularly uh, poignant issue on our campus. Uh, as an early American historian, I'd also like to say uh, that, Dean, you're absolutely right about the Second uh, Amendment. 
uh, that uh, restrictions uh, should be uh, permitted. Uh, but then I have a, a, just a very specific question. I read recently that what makes semi-automatic weapons uh, especially dangerous is not just the rapidity with which uh, they fire their ammunition, but it's the ammunition itself, which is unlike that used in uh, uh, handguns, for example. It may sound like a, a simplistic point, but uh, am I correct in thinking that this ammunition and semi-automatic weapons uh, does tremendous uh, damage uh, to the body that, uh, that other ammunition ordinarily does not? Yes, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, again, uh, even though the, the standard uh, point or 5.56 millimeter round isn't that large, it, it uh, has quite a charge behind it. The muzzle velocities are, are uh, very, very uh, fast. And again, so you know, remember from physics what force is uh, mass times acceleration. So the da the damage that uh, is done uh, physically. Uh, is, is just horrible. The, uh, you know, you see fractured bones, and again, I was called to the morgue uh, every night, uh, just about during the surge in Iraq when I was the hospital commander there. I had to unzip body bags and pronounce death in people, and so these injuries are devastating for uh, exactly the reasons you said. Another question over here. You know, I so when you made the comment about the rational thought, and and none of this is quite rational. What I'm about to say. However, it's even more irrational than, it's rationally irrational, how about that? <laughs> and the reason I'm saying this is that when you think about what this country and their implicit bias and unconscious bias and direct bias, when you compare the crack cocaine epidemic and what's now happening in opioid, no one in this room should not believe that the reason that we're talking about opioid epidemics as a crisis is because it's impacting more Caucasians versus underrepresented minorities. There's just no doubt about that. And now people are uh, adamant to do something about it. But when you look at this gun violence and you see the number of kids who are being killed in these, in these schools, it's actually more white kids. And, and you, one would think that even these people who are the NRA and have this believe they should tote their guns, et cetera, that they would rationally begin to see that this is a crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't. They, they are willing to sacrifice these lives for what? And so to me that kind of says that this NRA is just more powerful or somebody is more powerful than, than we think. And I'm just trying to figure out is there a path to rationalization of how you can make a argument with them that actually makes sense that would change people's mind? Mm -hmm. So people dying obviously don't do it. When you can see two-year-olds and four-year-olds and six-year-olds dying, that's obviously not doing it. Mm -hmm. So does anyone have a rational, an argument that would be irrationally rational <laughs> that would help these irrational people to actually make a rational decision. <laughs> time, for, time for an answer? <laughs> well, let's take a quick stab I'm because we really, cannot leave that unanswered. So. <laughs> I'm gonna be really brief. I think it's important to draw a line between the NRA's leadership and its membership. Mm. The common ground here is much, much greater. This is one piece of myth busting we do. The common ground here is much, much greater than people believe. I'm going to give you one example, and I'll stop. Comprehensive background checks, the requirement that every firearm purchase be subject to a background check to make sure the buyer's not a prohibited person. Opposed by the NRA's leadership, tooth and nail, um, but supported not just by 90% of the general population, not just by 80% of gun owners, but by 70% of NRA members. The NRA is an organization its leadership does not even represent the interests of its own membership, let, let alone the public at large. Common ground is there. We just need to stay on it. I would also agree with that. I wanted to like emphasize that point a lot. These are people just like us that feel the same way as us. 98% of people believe in the same concepts we're trying to enforce. It's about holding people accountable, like our politicians, who unfortunately are in the same bed with you know the NRA. They're getting paid tons of money to support their ideals. And so we need to find ways to 
use our power as citizens to push our politicians to do what we want. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry that we're out of time because I would have loved to take more questions and there's just, there's so much here, but thank you all so much for coming and sharing your stories.